Hi, I'm Paul Stern. I teach politics at Ursinus. And I'm Robert Dolly. I teach biology. So we have here an allegory, um, a metaphorical story of a cave. It's a metaphor for two different kinds of education, one of which occurs in the cave and to which according to Socrates, we have all been subjected throughout our lives, and a different kind of education that can only occur if you emerge from the cave. So Socrates says to Glaucon, uh, imagine this, imagine you have a cave, uh, outside it is the sunlit land, but inside the cave, the cave is lit by a fire, and prisoners are sitting in a row, bound, looking toward the far dark end of the cave, and the only light in the cave is a fire behind them. And that fire illuminates a procession of objects carried by people that walk past in front of our bound prisoners. And our prisoners have no choice but to watch each object as it goes by in such a way they don't see the people carrying it. They just see the objects. It's like a puppet show, really. Mm -hmm. So our prisoners are basically watching a puppet show in which they don't even get to see the actual puppets, they only see shadows of the puppets cast by a fake light. That is an artificial light, not the light of the sun. Um, and that, according to Socrates, is how we are all raised and the education that we take with us. Uh, and alternatively, there's an education to be had out in the light of the sun, which you can only achieve if you first leave the cave. And leaving the cave is, is a function, not in this depiction at any rate, not of self-liberation, um, because all of us prisoners are in fetters staring at the, at the screen where the shadows of the puppets dance. Um, there is some unnamed mysterious figure in the cave, maybe it's one of your teachers, who uh, has to unfetter you, liberate you, and at times drag you, kicking and screaming, up out of the cave. Uh, in suggesting, A, so attractive is the cave, you may not want to leave. Uh, the comforts, uh, the consolation of, of your beliefs, uh, hard to give up, hard to challenge. Uh, and, and also, you're, you're just not sure what's beyond the cave. Uh, maybe, maybe there's something you know, quite deadly, quite threatening. You don't know, having never uh, been there, uh, what it is that awaits you. So in that sense, your, your liberation is dependent on another human being. Uh, quite the way in which the, the inhabitants of the cave, their education is dependent on those who construct the artifacts, and that's the word used, namely the puppets, uh, whose shadows alone they see, um, so liberation from that is dependent on another human being. It's in both ways a quite uh, communal undertaking. The problem is, is that those two types of community are in tension. Uh, the political community on the one hand, which depends on everyone accepting what they're seeing in front of them, and the philosophic or intellectual community on the other, which precisely depends on everyone being willing not to accept, to ask about uh, the, the basis of those beliefs, to ask simply whether they're true. Whoa, it is bright out here. It's dazzling. It's dazzling. Man, I kind of wish I was back. <laughs> to take a more skeptical tack about the whole thing. Yeah. Um, at the end, what sounds like you have in this community, this just community, is, I don't know if the correct word is a hierarchy, but there are rulers and there are ruled. Yeah. Um, what about this education we're speaking um, really does ensure that the rulers will rule according to justice rather than according to their own desires. Now, now I do recognize by um, having 
we call gender equality and communism, right. we've eliminated quite a few sources yeah. of desires, but humans are still humans. Well, well, one of the arguments that Socrates makes, and there's sense to it, is um, it's precisely because the, the person that you're designating as the appropriate ruler um, has experienced a life better than rule and in fact regards uh, rule as, as a burden, as an imposition, as an injustice that in this case he will be a better ruler. That it's the, you want ruling the people who don't really want to rule because they are, at least this is the mm -hmm. argument, um, they are uh, less likely to be in it for the power and for mm -hmm. the things that power uh, can mm -hmm. acquire, the wealth, or the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. So, but um, there's also, and this is part of the, I guess you could say, um, utopian aspect of this dialogue, an intentionally utopian aspect, is uh, it's not clear that, uh, you know, knowing the things that a philosopher knows would necessarily or even be likely to translate into practice. Uh, that's, that's, you know, a view of the world which is ultimately not clear to me that uh, Plato holds. Um, that would be a view of the world as, as, as perfectly ordered such that the highest intelligibles can be translated uh, seamlessly into practice. And there's little um, support for that view in any dialogue. The ideas in the dialogues are always presented in a problematic context, as tentative, as hypothetical, as what we might wish for, but never really substantiated in argument. So, so the, the most utopian thing, and this is why it's the third wave, is to think that you can go directly from theory to practice. What then, and this is a much bigger question about the whole, the entire dialogue, the Republic, um, if it's utopian and Plato even sees it that way, what is the purpose of the dialogue? Besides providing endless grist just for, grist for discussions for college students well, for I, I, centuries. I think it's to, to think about um, what especially perhaps when we're younger, not only, but perhaps especially, we're, we're inclined to uh, have a passion for justice. And it's helpful to think, okay, what is it we would be required to establish this perfectly just community? Um, would we be willing to do that? Uh, would, it, would it be a place we would like to live? which possibly it would not, uh, and there, thereby suggesting some limits on what's possible politically, thinking that some of the greatest um, uh, atrocities have been a function of thinking that transformations in human life are both possible and desirable politically, and, and maybe they're not. Um, while we're here, this is not Raphael's School of Athens. The that's, yeah, that's in the Vatican. But it's here, Sinus Version from 20 years ago. So if you look high up there in green with gray skin, you will see Professor Stern as Socrates uh, pestering everybody else. And if you look over here, you will see in orange and red holding a globe of the earth, me with what the artist described as my arrogant nose, um, speaking to Ricky de Felici Antonio, former Dean of Admissions. What figure are you? I'm, oh, I am um, Ptolemy. Ptolemy. I am Ptolemy, wrong about the, the earth being the center of the universe. And of course, in the center, you have President Strasburger as Plato pointing up and Dean Judy Levy as Aristotle indicating down with an expression on her face that 
Strasburger has just had a dumb idea and she has to talk about it. <laughs> yes. He's the idealist. That will yeah. never work. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, as always. It's been a pleasure. Your conversation. Any questions? Thank you for tuning in. Please direct your questions to Professor Dolly. Right. <laughs> and we will now split. He will return to the philosopher's lair of Bomberger, and I will head off to the cave inside the Innovation and Discovery Laboratories. Bye-bye. That was fun. Yeah. Thanks, Tommy.